Hey, good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. State Representative Emmanuel Chris Welch here. I am back for one of my Facebook Live conversations, and I have an amazing guest for us this afternoon. You definitely want to tune in for the next half hour or so uh, and soak up some of this knowledge that we're about to receive from Mr. John Rogers. My guest is an investor. He's a philanthropist and founder of Aerial Capital Management, and now is co-CEO of Aerial Investments, the largest minority-run mutual fund firm in the entire country. Uh, he is a champion of corporate board diversity. I've watched his work very closely uh, and have filed several pieces of legislation based on principles he's championed his entire life. And he's founder of the Black Corporate Directors Conference, a regular contributor to Forbes magazine, and you can find him from time to time on CNBC. Uh, he's a proud graduate of the University of Chicago Lab Schools and Princeton University. Uh, he housed President Obama uh, at Ariel Investments in 2008 uh, for a couple of weeks as they were uh, in transition. It was the temporary White House, pretty much, right there in his office suite. And he beat Michael Jordan one-on-one. -on -one. That's who our guest is. Mr. John Rogers Jr., please welcome him for our Facebook Live conversation. How are you today, Mr. Rogers? I'm doing great. It's really good to be here. I'm, I'm going to have you tell us a little bit about that game against Michael Jordan. Uh, you might in, inspire him to do another uh, 10 weeks of uh, The Last Dance because you know he's extremely competitive. <laughs> I got very, very fortunate. It's been it's come alive again after the uh, last dance. Uh, ESPN and the undefeated did another uh, story about it with video. And and I start got the ABC. My friend Jim Rose had me on and uh, the Sun-Times did something. It's just been wonderful to see it sort of uh, recapture the imagination of uh, folks around the country. Um, but I know I was very fortunate, very lucky at the fantasy camp that he used to have every year for old guys like me. He would challenge anybody to a game of one on one. And I became the first one to beat him in the first seven years of the camp. And, <laughs> and he was a combination. You probably, of, hmm? you probably were the last one to beat him. Yeah, I, I think he stopped doing it after that. And I never went back to the camp. And, you know, you could hear him say, oh, no, when the last shot was just about to go in. And um, Damon Wayans, the comedian, came on and made fun of him. But I understand I was very lucky. You know, there was a short game. Michael was tired that day and and a little overconfident. So uh, I was very fortunate. And, and, and you know what? You're going to end right there. You're not you don't want a rematch. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's for sure. So I am talking to Mr. John Rogers, Jr., the co-CEO of Aerial Investments. Please share this conversation with your uh, list of friends because uh, you want to definitely soak up the knowledge that he's about to share with us. Uh, we're going to just jump right to it. And uh, well, let me ask you, what has the last couple of weeks of uh, civil unrest uh, told us about the historic racial implications of our economy? Well, I think the unrest shows you that our, our community is extraordinarily, extraordinarily frustrated and heartbroken by the lack of economic opportunity that we've been able to receive in this country. You know, it's been clear that the racial wealth gap's gotten larger and larger over the last 40 years. It's much, much worse than it was ever been. You know, my favorite data point is between 1992 and 2016, college-educated African-Americans saw their wealth decline 10%, while college-educated whites saw their wealth increase 96%. So up 96% for whites, down 10% for blacks. It's just an incredible, incredible tragedy that we're facing, the lack of economic opportunity that we're receiving. And as we know, it's gone on generation by generation. We haven't been able to fully participate in our capitalist democracy. And of course, when you don't have wealth and you don't have equal income, you're going to have all the challenges that we face, you know, poorer education, poorer housing, poorer health care. All those things come from economic opportunity that we've been denied in this country. You know, I have been talking about uh, the George Floyd murder uh, pretty regularly uh, since it happened. And, you know, some of the things that are being posted on my social media pages uh, are some unbelievable comments that I've seen uh, and just 
it seems like a lack of knowledge. Um, and one of uh, my favorite Dr. Martin Luther King quotes, and I believe it's one of your favorite quotes, is that many white Americans of goodwill have never connected bigotry with economic exploitation. They have deplored prejudice, but tolerated or ignored economic injustice. And it doesn't seem like the wealth gap in this country is getting any better. I just posted an article on my social media page yesterday. Uh, Northwestern University did a, a comprehensive research, research study that said for every dollar that white Americans get, have, black Americans have one cent. For every dollar that white Americans have, uh, we have one cent. Um, why is that? Well, I think it's uh, it's many, 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 many reasons. Some of it, as we know, is the unconscious implicit bias that's out there. You know, people think that we've gotten where we are from affirmative action and uh, don't think we're as talented as the white Americans. And that's a huge part of this. The second part of it is uh, our big corporations that have all these commitments to diversity and inclusion. They haven't been hiring us in the senior roles for the most part. We know most of the major private equity firms, venture capital firms, hedge funds, have never had an African-American partner, very few executives in the leadership roles. We also know that when the big companies say they're doing business with black businesses, they typically only allow us to do the supply chain work, construction, catering. Those things are important, but the economy has moved on to a professional services, financial services, and technology-based economy. And we need to be included in the parts of the economy where the wealth is being created today. And we have to get away from this term supplier diversity and use what the University of Chicago calls business diversity so that we can be included in everything and help put pressure on these companies to do business with us in the areas where, again, the real wealth and jobs and power is created today. You know, one of my good friends, Alderman David Moore, has really been uh, rallying uh, for black construction companies, especially right now. Uh, after uh, looting took place in his ward, uh, companies like Walgreens was hiring non-black contractors to do the work. Uh, and there have been strong calls by all of them more and several members of the Joint uh, Caucus of Black Elected Officials for black construction companies and contractors to be hired. Uh, do you think this will do the trick? The fact that here we are in a watershed moment in this history, will this do the trick? Will companies see the light and start hiring black companies? Well, I think that they will, if we can get people out of this comfort zone of just hiring us to do the construction and the catering, which again, are very important careers and very important jobs. But if you think about it, the state right now, our governor is a venture capitalist. He's a billionaire. Our last yeah. governor, Bruce Rauner, was in private equity, almost a billionaire. Our mayor was an investment banker, you know, very successful. You know, the mayor of New York City, Michael Bloomberg, was in finance and technology. That's where the wealth and power is. Our most, the wealthiest guy in Illinois right now is Ken Griffin. He's worth over $10 billion. They're naming the Science Industry Museum after him. So it's just not fair. I call it a modern J Jim Crow if you hire black people only to do the lowest margin, least profitable parts of the spin, and let the white guys get all the money in the largest businesses. If you look at the Cranes list of Chicago's top 300 companies, roughly, 350 companies, roughly, there are only four African-American companies in that list of the top 353. None make the top 150. Not one company in the top 150 privately held companies in Chicago. So it's not working for us to be only allowed to be in certain areas of the spin where, again, the white guys get to do all the areas where the real wealth and the real jobs and the real political power is being created in today's economy. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, one of the problems that's holding us back uh, from being the Ken Griffins of the world uh, is that uh, these banks continue to ignore us. Uh, there was a report just out this week. The FDIC published a report about the decline in minority owned banks. In the mid 1980s, there were nearly 15,000 commercial banks across the country compared to just about 4,500 last year. 
the, the decline is largely due to the closure of minority owned banks. Uh, what impact do you think that has had uh, on minority business across the board? Because I have an 850 credit score and I, I get rejected for loans all the time from the white banks. Uh, you know, minority banks are were very critical uh, to minorities getting uh, into business. Well, you're exactly right about that. You know, my father, you know, who's a Tuskegee Airman, would always, he took me to Independence Bank to open up my first checking account when I was, uh, you know, 10, 12 years old. He felt it was important for us to support black banks. And we went to uh, federal, went to the Illinois Federal Savings, uh, savings Loan, where I had a savings account. He thought it was important to work with black financial institutions. Um, we know George Johnson, who started Afrosheen and Ultrasheen, you know, Johnson Products. He was one of my heroes, one of my role models. He founded Independence Bank that became the largest black bank in the country, right on the south side of Chicago. And then, of course, we had Seaway National Bank. With Jacoby Dickens was the CEO. It became one of the largest black banks in the country. Chicago was a mecca for black financial institutions. And we've lost all of that. And part of it is because these major corporations downtown, you know, the Walgreens, the Kraft Heinz, the, again, the, the big universities, DePaul, Loyola, Roosevelt, Columbia, IIT, the, most of the nine museums in the park, from the Field Museum to the Planetarium to the Art Institute, are not supporting our black financial institutions. If our anchor institutions in our community don't support our black financial institutions, how are we able to, ever going to be able to grow and keep them alive and keep them thriving? And that's why we've lost those businesses and why they've disappeared. You know, for many just generations, Mr. Rogers, black business has been under attack. This didn't just start, uh, whether it's from the looting of Freedman's Bank during Reconstruction or even the Tulsa race riots, which our president seems to not give a care about because he's holding a rally there on Juneteenth. Uh, your family has some ties to that area. Uh, what can be done going forward to support and increase black business? Is there a stairway uh, to get us to uh, these private equity guys? Uh, how do we get there? Well, I think we have to do a couple of things. And, and you're right, my family was had ties to Tulsa. My great grandfather owned the uh, Stratford Hotel, which is one of the most successful businesses in Tulsa that got burned down the race riots. And uh, my gran great grandfather, came home to Chicago or came back to Chicago as he was really didn't want to get sent back to Tulsa where he might have been uh, lynched during that period. So it was really, um, I just keep thinking how much that hotel would be worth today if it was still in existence. And we'd have some real wealth in the Rogers family if they hadn't burned down our hotel 99 years ago in Tulsa. But, you know, I think the thing that we think about, as you mentioned earlier, we do a conference every year for African-Americans on corporate boards. Yeah. We have uh, roughly 200 African-American directors show up every year. We have tremendous speakers, everyone you would expect from Don Thompson and Ken Chenault to Barack Obama and Valerie Jarrett and Eric Holder to uh, white CEOs like Jamie Dimon, um, Jeff Emel, et cetera. It's been extraordinarily successful. Uh, and what we try to do at the conference is to get all the blacks that are on corporate boards to agree to do three things, to measure three Ps when they're in those corporate boardrooms. One, of course, is people. Measure the executive ranks of the company boards you're on, uh, making sure that your companies are, have blacks in the most senior roles on the management committees in the executive suites. We need to measure that and hold people accountable uh, for making progress in that area. Secondly, we know that all these large companies have partnerships with the major consulting firms, the investment banks, the law firms, the accounting firms, all those different institutions. And we need to hold them accountable for the diversity of their teams. And if you hire an investment bank, do what Harold Washington insisted on or what Maynard Jackson insisted on. Make sure there are going to be black executives servicing the account when you're in that boardroom and measure that. Uh, Exelon does the best job in America on that under a program that Bill Von Haney started, where any bank, any investment bank, any law firm, if they're not doing the right things by having black partners working with the company that, you're, that he's involved in, they're not going to be able to do business with that company any longer. The second, and, and I can say this quickly, the second P is around purchasing, measuring the spend with black businesses across the board in everything that we do. Uh, from marketing to advertising to financial services, professional services, technology. Make sure that you're keeping track of the spend with everything you, everything that's bought in that company. 
And I know Exelon's done a great job of that too. McDonald's has done had a long history of working and supporting black franchisees and black suppliers. And there are many other companies that have done a great, great job too, but too few, way, way, way too few. And then finally, the third P is philanthropy, measuring how much of the philanthropic dollars are going to civil rights organizations, not just going to the local opera or the symphony, but going to institutions that impact our community. And those are the three things that we think if all of us agree to do in all of our leadership roles, we can have a profound impact in our community and build real lifelong wealth and income in black communities. You know, corporate board diversity is near and dear to you. And you helped me with a bill that we passed last year and Governor Pritzker signed. It goes into effect in January with corporations having to re report their corporate makeup and in March, we're going to grade them on their corporate board diversity, and that's going to be an annual thing. I think a report card, uh, putting these companies out there on, on, you know, and give them credit or, or putting them on blast is going to make a big difference. But I'm looking ahead, and many of them are going to say, we can't find any Black people who are qualified to be on these boards. What can Black people be doing now to make themselves visible uh, and show these corporations that uh, they're ready, willing, and able to serve on these corporations or to get ready to serve on these corporate boards? Well, I mean, I think that, of course, we have to make ourselves visible. We have to get engaged and involved in our local civil rights organizations, support our local progressive political leaders, be engaged and involved in our community so that people know about our leadership, know about our skills. They see us volunteering and helping, and that can be a vehicle to get on a corporate board. But at the same time, you know, the University of Chicago has a great program uh, to work with minority owned companies. And it came from a conversation I was having with President Bob Zimmer about 11 years ago. And one of the things I said, Bob, he was trying to have more African-Americans on the board of the University of Chicago. And he was having trouble at the time finding talented people. I said, well, Bob, if every progressive institution like the University of Chicago never works with black businesses, never ask their majority institutions to have black partners on the relationship with the university. How do you expect us to be able to create the wealth and stature to qualify to be on the board? And Bob said as a mathematician that I had sort of helped him think about solving this problem differently. That's why if we wanna see more of us on the boards, we've got to go back to Harold Washington and Maynard Jackson's playbook. Make sure we're included in everything that we do. We're talented business executives. We're talented business leaders and we're talented entrepreneurs. We've got to get these anchor institutions in our community to work with us. Give us a fair shot. Give us a fair shake. Then we'll be more and more and more successful. Our kids will be more and more successful. And then we'll be eligible to be on every board possible. But as long as we're excluded from our capitalist democracy, it gets harder and harder. It becomes a vicious cycle that we are challenged by in today's society. You know, you're on the board of Nike, McDonald's Corporation, and New York Times. Uh, you, you've, you've been uh, in this space for some time. When you see corporations running commercials uh, as a result of the civil unrest, uh, talking about Black Lives Matter and they appreciate their Black associates, uh, you know, what, what, what's your response to that? Or your reaction? Response is, I mean, that's terrific that they're doing that. But then my next question, are you using black advertising agency for that work? Um, are you putting ads into Black Enterprise Magazine on WVON Radio? Are you supporting our community with business opportunities versus just writing the checks and just talking a good game and telling the story? Again, we deserve, this is a capitalist democracy we live in. If we don't create wealth and jobs and equal income in our society, for our people, we're not gonna be able to move forward. We'll continue to go backwards the way we have the last 40 years or so. And we won't be able to get close to Dr. King's dream. I think this is a watershed moment in our nation's history. And we're gonna uh, be putting forth our black agenda and uh, calling for special session uh, here in Illinois. Uh, the governor has appeared with us at Days of Action organized by the Joint Caucus of Black Elected Officials. Uh, a lot of folks would like us to rush and just do something. Uh, but we want to take our time, listen to the community's input, get input from various sectors. Uh, and when we go put our Black agenda on the table, uh, we want people to know uh, that it's a comprehensive agenda, that we've listened to various constituent groups. Uh, and we're going to make our demands. Uh, Frederick Douglass said, 
uh, power can seize nothing without a demand. I'm getting calls from uh, colleagues on the other side of the aisle, some of them much more conservative than I, I would ever be. Uh, you know, what would you say to white people who are reaching out right now saying, how can I help? Uh, what would be your response to those who want to help in this moment? I think they have to do what we've been talking about. They've got to hire us in senior jobs, senior positions at the companies they're involved in. If they hire an investment bank or a law firm or a consulting firm or a PR firm or whatever, they got to demand that black people are, are, are part of the team that works with that company that they're engaged and involved in. Again, just what Harold and Maynard did. At the same time, they should be looking for the support of African-American entrepreneurs. And not only at the companies where they work, but in the nonprofits where they sit on the boards, because all these traditionally white executives, not only are they in the C-suite of the companies they're involved in, but they sit on the board of the museums, the hospitals, the universities, and the other anchor institutions in our community that have huge budgets too. These huge, large, these universities and museums spend a fortune and very little of it comes to black people unless we're doing the construction or the catering. We want to do everything. And these anchor institutions that come down to Springfield and ask for support and help all the time, they go to Washington and get bailed out during these crises. They get all that money and never think that a dime of it should go to black people. It is just a shame. It is, it's immoral. It's irresponsible. And it's exactly why we are in the position we're in, because we're allowing this to happen. These white institutions refuse to support and work with black businesses and, and work with black business executives we're not going to be able to move forward. And we know how important it is when you have black executives in leadership roles, they matter. If it's a Frank Clark at, at Exelon, or whether it's a James Bell at Boeing, uh, they make a difference. A Don Thompson at McDonald's, uh, you know, the folks at the Northern Trust Bank that you all know, the Lyle Logans of the world, you know, the, 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 the Chandran Thomases, the Jason Tylers. When you have blacks in leadership roles, they make a difference for all of us. But it doesn't happen unless we insist on it and push hard for it. You know, corporations aren't the only ones with the responsibility here. Uh, I see it as our duty as black elected officials uh, to, you know, pull up people from our community. Um, I've been meeting around the clock with my elected colleagues, and there's a lot of work for us to do. What would you tell us? You, you've got black elected officials around your table, uh, and we're looking to you for advice. Uh, what can elected officials do locally and across the country that's going to have an immediate impact on black business? Well, I mean, one is, you know, following your footsteps, you've been you've made a difference uh, with your legislation and legislative initiatives have truly made a difference. I talk about it everywhere I go. You have really moved the ball down the field. So you're a real example and role model. Thank you. you know, the next thing, though, is they just have to understand that there's some terminology that just needs to change. The term supplier diversity needs to be replaced with business diversity because the economy has evolved. You know, we're playing like it's a blockbuster video versus Netflix. The world has shifted. It's that dramatic. That's where the wealth is. The second thing is we need to get rid of this term access to capital. You know, we need loans. We need banks to work with us, but we need access to customers too. And if we can get these anchor institutions to be our customers, we will grow our businesses. But if they feel like they've done their job, then we can get a micro loan somewhere, but then they go and continue to do business with the same white institutions they've always done business with, we don't go anywhere. So I know that's what Harold Washington would be saying. Again, Maynard Jackson, Coleman Young in Detroit, Marion Barry in DC, Tom Bradley. We need to come back to that kind of leadership to understand how important black businesses are and black business leaders are to our community. And that's the advice I would, I would give the state legislative leaders get to those three P's, measuring the people, the purchasing by category, and the philanthropy, and we can all move forward together. You're the chief investment officer for uh, Ariel and uh, co-CEO, and one of the greatest, 99 greatest investors, uh, recognized uh, in the book by Charlotte Merton uh, and Magnus Egenfeld. Uh, can you give, uh, us folk out there who really admire your 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 acumen here in this space, some general investment tips uh, with us going forward and how we build wealth. I think the major thing is, you know, our logo at Aerial Investments is a turtle. 
to remind people to be patient mm -hmm. and to take a long, long-term perspective. And so that's the number one thing. Take a long-term perspective. Invest in what you understand. You know, I, I was talking to my barber that I go to, uh, you know, and we were having, you know, getting the haircut. And I said, you know, you love basketball like I do. You, know, you can buy stock in Madison Square Garden Entertainment and own part of that huge, extraordinary facility, the world's greatest arena. You know, invest in what you understand, what you like to read about. Uh, don't try to get the hot new tip. And the third thing I would say is that Warren Buffett always reminds us that last century, the Dow Jones Industrial Average went from 66 to 11,000 last century. You know, we had a pandemic, as we all know now, in 1919. Right. We had two world wars. We had a Great Depression, war in Vietnam, many, many recessions. But the market always moved higher. So once you get into that market, stick with your favorite names that you know well and own them for the long run. Don't try and be a trader. And that was the key themes that I would talk about. So over the last couple of months, there's been a lot of angst about the, about the market. Uh, you know, it, it's gone down. It looked like it was going back up for a while, going back down. Uh, you know, should we be worried? I mean, is this the time to, 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 to practice what you preach and just be patient? Do we uh, cash out or stop contributing to our 401ks? Uh, should we be worried right now? We shouldn't be worried. You know, as I said, you know, we always find a way in this country to bounce back from whatever challenges we're facing. So I'm highly confident we're going to bounce back from this and we'll be back on track by the time we get to 2021. Um, there's a lot of bargains out there. You know, I have some favorite stocks. People know Viacom, CBS, you know, that's a great brand. People are watching television. People need good content. It's going to be there for the long run. Uh, I have a company, Invest Invista, that I love that makes dental products. And even though dental offices were closed for a long time, they're reopening again. And, um, you know, people are going back to the dentist and people manufacturing those products would do well. And my other fun idea is we own Vail now, the ski resorts. And if you think about it, what's the best sport for a pandemic is skiing because you always have a mask on. You're always going to be able to protect yourself and your skis are so big. You're always going to be socially distanced okay. because people can't get too close to you. So people will be going back to Vail this winter and skiing up a storm. And uh, so those are a couple of the kind of ideas that we're looking at and investing in today. So if someone's never heard of aerial investments and they're listening to you today uh, and they're like, wow, I, I, I got to follow up with him. How how can people do business with aerial investments? Well, thank you. I appreciate you asking that. They can uh, you know, find us online at you know, aerialinvestments.com. Uh, and um, invest with us directly. Also, they can go to their financial advisor. If they have a financial advisor or an insurance broker they work with, they can ask them if, you know, hey, use aerial funds in my account. And we spend a lot of time cultivating financial advisors, hoping they'll work with us. And then finally, to go to their place of work and ask why isn't aerial investments one of the options in my 401k plan or my 403b or my 457 plan. We can fit into almost every, every plan and then finally, we are a part of the state of Illinois' 529 program. That's uh, right. To, yeah, Treasurer Frericks, they've got that done with the help of many others. And uh, we are so proud to be there. And with all the work that Melody Hobson and our firm has done around financial literacy, we think it's great that the young people of, of, of Illinois can access our mutual funds in the 529 program. You know, I only have a minute left. And I am always respectful of time. I appreciate a busy guy like you giving me some time on a Sunday afternoon. I have one question. You talked about your father uh, being a Tuskegee Airman. Uh, you didn't mention your mother, but she was the first black female graduate from the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, people don't know that. How did their level of achievement influence you? Well, th they were pioneers. They, they were tough, smart extraordinarily hard working. So I think I inherited their work ethic and how hard they worked and their willingness to be entrepreneurs, to try to build up their own legal practices because they couldn't work for the big white firms downtown when they got out of law school. And my mom taught me that anything was possible. If you worked really, really hard, even with all the discrimination we faced, if you worked doubly hard, opportunities would come your way. So she showed me the way. And uh, so it's pretty cool today. She actually, if you watch uh, Sunday morning with George Stephanopoulos, there was a picture of her on the television show this morning. Oh, no kidding. 
Yeah, one of the roundtable participants wrote a book about the loneliness of black Republicans. And my mom was on the cover, um, seconding Richard Nixon's 1960 nomination. No, so even I'm a, yeah. So that was a nice surprise this morning. So even though I'm a very liberal Democrat, it was good <laughs> to see my mom uh, doing her Republican work. I, I promise you that was my last question. But I got to have one more. What was it like to house President Obama in your office space after he was elected the first black president of the United States? That was one of the highlights of, of my life, uh, to see him walk in the day after that great, great celebration in Grand Park was a magical, magical moment. He could have started his government anywhere, and he decided to do it in a small black company, Aerial Investments. We were, we were just so, so proud and thrilled to be part of his team. Well, that, that's awesome. I've been in that area where he, he worked out of, and I feel special just to have walked in that same space. <laughs> so thank you for taking time with me this afternoon, and I always appreciate you and your guidance that you've given me. Uh, and uh, I'll be calling for more guidance very soon. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay well, Mr. Rogers. Appreciate you. You all see you on Tuesday night when I have three of my Republican colleagues, Representative Grant Worley, Representative Keith Wheeler, and Representative Tom Bennett will be joining me for the difficult conversation on how they can help invest in Black communities. Thank you all and have a great day. Take care.